Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center's Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's episode is titled Anxious Politics, Democracy in the Age of Partisanship. I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Shana Gadarian from Syracuse University. Today is April the 2nd. I'm sorry, September the 2nd. I'm already losing months. Uh, my name is Andy Mink. I'm the Vice President of Education at the Center. And on behalf of my team, Mike, Jira, and Meredith, I want to welcome all of you back tonight to uh, what is our second episode for this year's season. In fact, it's the second of the week. And it's um, uh, I appreciate seeing many of you uh, now joining us the second night uh, in a row. I value all the, the new faces we have. In particular, I want to thank uh, Thomasine, who's up uh, near Richmond, Virginia, for joining us tonight. Jonathan's in the western part of North Carolina at Mars Hill University. Uh, always great to see Denise here. She's at Miramar Beach in Florida. Uh, Barsha is joining us tonight from Granada Hills, the Valley Academy of Arts and Sciences. But as much as I love seeing all these folks from all over the country, Rashida, I have to give you special credit for being here all the way from Morocco. Thank you for being, uh, whatever time it is right now in, in Morocco, thank you for joining us. Um, I also want to take a moment and extend our, our thoughts and our sympathies to all the folks in Louisiana and uh, the Gulf states. Uh, Hurricane Ida is a, just a devastating event. Growing up on the coast in Virginia, I know that you know, these kinds of severe weather have uh, the immediate effect, but they also have long lasting effects uh, in the communities, for schools, for teachers as they're struggling to keep their kids being now reintroduced to us uh, to a to a almost post pandemic uh, environment. And of course, our folks and our friends in New England and New York who are suffering from the flooding uh, that that Ida brought. Uh, we want to uh, extend our, our well wishes and strong thoughts. And if there's any way that we at the center can help, uh, we, we certainly would like to do that. Um, the National Humanities Center is is facing a return for uh, the coming year next week, much like many of you have in your schools and classrooms. This year's incoming fellowship class will be joining us on Tuesday. Uh, these are uh, academics and professors, experts in their fields from all over the country. In fact, I think this year we might have five or six international fellows who are moving to North Carolina to come to this building on a daily basis for the full academic year to do their work and to essentially create the humanities, uh, create interpretations of the world we live in through the disciplinary lenses that each of them work in. Um, that work, as well as all of the work we do in education, uh, can be found in our digital uh, library. Each of you have signed up for a free uh, membership card or a library card for this OER platform. Um, I very much encourage you and your colleagues to use it not only to access materials, but also to do curriculum work, to publish your own materials, and to uh, really be able to, uh, in a cross-discoverable, interdisciplinary way, find other resources that match your interests and, uh, and that you can take to your classroom. I will encourage you to sign up for the Humanities in Class webinar series group in that library. Imagine this a little bit like a conference room. And in that conference room, uh, we've assembled and we have archived all the materials associated with each of the webinars that we've led for the last six years. That does include the recordings as well as the PowerPoints and various other resources and readings that have been pulled together. And that includes tonight's session. So uh, uh, Professor uh, Guderian was, uh, was generous enough to pull together some readings and some resources for you that will accompany tonight. And I encourage you to go in and take a look at those either as we're talking tonight, as you're listening to the conversation, or what's more likely afterwards when you've had a chance to process um, all of what she'll be sharing. I'm also very pleased that the digital library uh, invites organizations from all over the country, from all kinds of disciplines to also contribute resources to, uh, to this OER site. Um, in addition to the National Humanities Center, we have about 95 other organizations, and so that includes uh, one of our featured resources tonight, that is um, the uh, Leventhal Map Center at the Boston Public Library. I'm very pleased to welcome Lynn Brown tonight, who's going to share just a little bit about uh, the resources they have that are aligned to tonight's topic and that you might find helpful in your own teachings of civics and political science. Hey, Lynn, can you hear me up in Boston? I sure can. Hi, everybody. Um, thank, I'm thank Lynn. So I'm, the K I'm sorry? I just said thank you so much for joining. Oh, sure. Um, so I'm Lynn. I'm the K-12 Education Manager at the Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library in the homelands of the Massachusetts and Wampanoag people. 
And we're a nonprofit responsible for the care and interpretation of the library's extensive map collection. We have over 200,000 maps and 5,000 atlases, over 10,000 of them, which are available in high resolution digital format in our digital collection. And you can access them at leventhalmap.org on your screen. Um, but caring for and developing our map collection is only one part of what we do. When you visit our website, you'll see all the ways we engage the public with maps and geographic thinking. We host talks and conversations with cartographers, scholars, and activists. We hold workshops to teach people about GIS and data mapping. We develop curriculum and teach K-12 students about how to read maps and how to use them to understand history in their communities. We provide professional development for educators. We publish articles on maps and geographic topics on our website and on social media. And we put up exhibitions in our gallery space for visitors to think about our world through the lens of maps. So our current exhibition is a great fit for this evening's webinar on the relationship between politics and emotions in this time of heightened anxiety. And some of what I saw in the pre-show chat just now Bending lines, maps, and data from distortion to deception is a digital and opening at the end of next week, a physical exhibition exploring how maps distort reality, whether intentionally for a political purpose or unintentionally because that's just the nature of maps. Our objective is to encourage viewers to exercise map literacy practices so they can create their own reasoned evaluative readings of historical maps to contemporary statistical GIS maps and everything in between. As it says in the introduction to the exhibition, thinking carefully about motivations, meaning, persuasion, and presentation helps us to construct trust in an informed, critical manner. Every map has a perspective, but not every perspective is as good as every other. It may be impossible to unbend the lines, but we can examine how and why they get bent. One example of how we address these issues in the exhibit can be seen here. We commissioned a small number of cartographers to choose from a small number of data sets to create two maps that tell conflicting stories. The data is the same. The stories the maps tell are definitely not. In this case, a data set on public transit in Boston led to the creation of two maps. The first, a map that uses a nostalgic visual theme to imply a golden age of extensive access and the second, a visualization of a transit desert in which most Boston residents do not live within a 10 minute walk from the subway. So if you're interested in thinking about those issues or if you're just interested in maps and how they reflect our world, please visit us at leventhalmap.org and um, we're happy to help you in any way we can. Lynn, thanks so much for sharing that. It's really remarkable to, uh, to see the ways that maps as stories, as narratives can take the same data sets and tell two completely stories with two very different uh, conclusions. And you know, part of what all these educators are struggling to do is provide students with a kind of critical background to analyze sources, even those that they likely assume are static and permanent and accurate, things like maps. Thank you, Lynn, for your help, and we appreciate your partnership. You're so welcome. I also want to point our audience to other webinars coming uh, this year in our season that uh, involve political science or civics uh, topics and themes. Uh, take a look at that long uh, uh, list. You can sign up for as many as you like. As you know, all of our webinars are free and come with the resources that, uh, that we provide afterwards. Um, we have many different topics that address much of what uh, Lynn just shared, particularly uh, the work with Sandy Darity. This is a new webinar we just added to the series. So, if you come in, uh, if you signed up before the school year started and you signed up for everything you thought you'd want, we just added a new one. Sandy Darity, a professor of public policy at Duke University, will be sharing his most recent work on reparations uh, titled 40 Acres and the 21st Century. Our webinars uh, earn five credit hours uh, per session. Our online courses earn 35 credit hours. Those of you who are interested in exploring topics with more depth and more uh, more time, I do encourage you to take a look at our online course catalog. Each of these courses uh, asks about five hours of work from you per week, so it's about the same as attending a webinar. Uh, these are blended courses with both synchronous and asynchronous components and a live instructor. Uh, we will be launching a brand new course that we created with the New York Historical Society uh, in just a few weeks titled Women of the Americas, Early Encounters in Entangled Histories. And if you're interested, please go to our website and take a look.
Finally, I want to thank our new Teacher Advisory Council. The 21-22 uh, cohort has been named and welcomed and oriented to all the work they'll be doing uh, with us this year. Um, these are 21 educators from across the country, and we very much appreciate their efforts to not only review and make relevant our work, but um, really to give us a sneak peek what it's like to be in a classroom right now, especially in this disrupted uh, uh, academic year that we're facing. Tonight's webinar, as you know, is an audio and PowerPoint driven webinar, but there are a couple of key tips that I'd like to offer before we begin. Uh, to start with, there is a volume button just underneath uh, the photograph, which now will be me again. And underneath that, you can adjust the volume to hear us more clearly or better. If for some reason, though, it's your Wi-Fi is not working or it's just not coming in the way you want, uh, you can simply exit out of the room and log back in, and that uh, almost always kickstarts it. We would like you to participate and be uh, pretty voracious and even violent in uh, your questions. Uh, you can drop questions for Professor Guderian in the Ask the Professor box, or if you'd like to just uh, share thoughts and comments and resources in the audience chat, uh, we encourage you to do so. As the moderator, I'll be watching those questions and bring them to uh, Dr. Guderian when the time seems right. So again, you have joined uh, the Humanities in Class webinar series for tonight's episode. It's titled Anxious Politics, Democracy in the Age of Partisanship. I'm joined by uh, Shana Guderian, who is a professor and department chair of political science at Syracuse University. Hey, uh, doctor, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> Fantastic. I can. Thank you for joining us. And I appreciate your toe tapping as we uh, open tonight with top political uh, songs of the last 30 years. Um, before we begin, I wonder if I can ask you to, to sort of set a baseline for our audience. And then I'm going to turn the slides over to you. Um, you know, we've got folks from teaching from a variety of levels and disciplines and politics and current events and partisanship. They touch a lot of these disciplines, but you work in a very specific field, political science. Can you tell us and make visible for us what, what exactly does a political scientist do? Like, how do you see the world as a political science that might be different than an historian or a, um, yeah, an, an economist or something? Sure. What a great question. Um, and thanks for asking that. So I actually just taught my first graduate class of the semester where we discussed what the kind of history of the field of political science is and why it's different than other fields. I think the thing about political science that's different than history or economics is, although they're cognate dif disciplines and we're all interested in social behaviors and social policies, is that Politics is very interested in power and agency, and what's different is that we're also interested in the state. So we're very interested in how what makes up the modern state and how the modern state influences and is influenced by the citizenry. So I think that would be, I think, the biggest difference between economists who care about, you know, social processes, um, cash flows and capital flows um, and political scientists who care about how governance structures and institutions matter separately from corporations, mm -hmm. for instance. Yeah, that's a great answer. And, and I'm going to ask you to maybe put a, a slightly finer point on it. Tell us a little bit about the scientist part, because, you know, in this humanities world, that, that word really, it's, it stands out. Sure. And I, I have a little bit of a p imposter syndrome because I am s myself not a humanist, although I'm, I appreciate uh, there is a humanist part of political science. So our political theorists um, who think about the ideas of, again, citizenry and mm -hmm. what makes the state and um, what it means to be ethical in politics, use a kind of humanist lens, um, do deep mm -hmm. dives into literature. Um, but for many of us who do more empirical work, whether that's qualitative or quantitative, we are using the scientific method to draw hypotheses, to test them with empirical data. And while that data might be qualitative interviews, for instance, or even ethnography, some of us, and I'll talk about tonight, are using survey research or experiments like I do um, with, um, mm -hmm. with individuals in the public. So there's a wide variety of methods, um, but many of, most of them in the, on the empirical side are kind of following the kind of normal scientific method of right. drawing hypotheses and testing them with data. Yeah, and that's such a different uh, skill set and a, and a way to, um, to form conclusions. On the other hand, I suspect a lot of humanists would be able to describe something similar in the sense that it's 
evidence-based um, that, that it's argument drawing from data and from both quantitative and qualitative work. But I appreciate you sharing that because it's, you know, it's one of those terms that sometimes I feel we can use loosely and maybe not always understand how, uh, how direct and how, how um, specific that field is. Thank you. Sure. All right. Am I taking it away? You are taking it away. And again, okay. uh, I, I'll bring questions to you on occasion, but okay. um, we're, we're anxious. We're anxious to hear more about anxious politics. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to, as usual, have prepared too much uh, information. So I'm going to start the discussion today by talking about um, a book that I wrote with my colleague Bethany Albertson at University of Texas called Anxious Politics. This book came out in 2015, um, and it is about um, the many anxieties of democracy small d democratic life. Um, and we are focused very much on the United States, but we can think about how these theories travel. I'm only going to talk about um, basically one part of the book, and then I'm going to transition and we can take questions um, in between. I'm going to transition to think about how the what we found in this 2015 book might or might not translate into the current moment and the pandemic that we're living through right now. Okay, so let's just start by setting the stage that um, you might have noticed that even prior to the last 18 months, political life in the United States is often quite anxiety producing, whether it's about um, viruses on the loose or often for people immigration as an issue or climate change or terrorism are either by their nature quite anxiety producing and we'll talk about what the definition is of anxiety that we're relying on in the book or are made to um, be fear inducing by political actors for their own purposes and we'll talk about those different kinds of issues um, as we go so in the book um, in anxious politics, we talk about anxiety that is derived from politics in four different policy areas. We talk about immigration anxiety, we talk about public health anxieties, we talk about climate change and terrorism. I'm really going to focus mostly on the public health part tonight. Um, and then again, happy to answer questions about any of the other parts. Um, and so again, you might have noticed that this there is a very anxious time. Um, that we are living through, particularly um, with the coronavirus pandemic. Okay, so before we go on and think about how this kind of anxiety influences the kinds of attitudes that um, Americans form, who they trust, and um, what kind of information they're looking for, I wanna back up and talk about what are our definitions of anxiety that we're using. So we're relying mostly on um, the psychology literature in emotion that talks about anxiety as an unpleasant and aversive state, right? It comes, anxiety comes from our evolution and it is very useful in detecting dangers and threats in the environment that can help us survive, okay? So, and the key purpose, as Einstein says, is to facilitate detection of danger or threat in potentially threatening environments. But those threatening environments might be quite different, right? So, you know, detecting a, a lion on the savanna to try and um, survive as early, um, you know, early man is quite different from like what it is in a modern society, what is threatening, what could hurt you or harm you at physically or um, in your kind of identity in politics. But the keys here are to think that anxiety has basically two different parts. It's a recognition of threat and uncertainty about how that threat might influence you. Um, and then this leads to people wanting to, co um, to cope with that emotion because anxiety is quite unpleasant for those of you who have experienced it. Um, particularly, and here again, we're talking about, because we're political scientists, we're interested in anxieties that come from modern politics. Political anxiety, as all anxiety is, is uncomfortable, and it leads to a desire for people to want to be protected, okay? And therefore, what we argue in this book is that this anxiety leads to support for policies and political leaders that, will, that people believe will effectively protect them from the threats that either they themselves recognize or political leaders tell them they should recognize. So um, people, when you feel anxious, one of the things that we expect is that people will seek information that can be used to protect them from harm and mitigate their threats. 
but we look at a variety in the book we look at a variety of coping mechanisms that people in politics might use in order to feel better about the uncertainty and the threat that they're seeing in um, in different policy areas so in the book we look at three i'm only going to talk through one of these tonight um, but again happy to answer questions about the others um, and i'll talk about how we test this theory um, through the lens of the public health threats that we look at so um, we look at political information seeking, that is we're interested in how citizens cope with political anxiety by looking for information, how much, what they seek out, what they remember. We look at how citizens cope with anxiety through putting their trust in government, not just generally in government, but in particular actors in government. And we also look at what types of policies anxious people want, um, and again, when their anxiety is about politics. We don't think that just generalized anxiety should have political implications here. We're really talking about politics, anxiety that comes from political life. We talk about different kinds of threats that we see in politics. And this is one of the areas that we can talk about in the Q&A about whether or not the way that we've broken out these threats actually makes sense in our kind of increasingly polarized um, environment. So one that we call, we, we call these different kinds of threats either unframed or framed. That is, unframed threats are ones that we have uh, widely agreed upon in the polity um, cause of the harm, and the harms can include imminent bodily harm or death, right? These are things that we shouldn't have to explain to people why they are harmful. Um, and here in the, the examples we give are things like disease outbreaks. And so again, I want you to kind of have this in your mind when we're thinking about COVID. Why is it um, in, in this book, which I, again, we started in 2007, came out in 2015, we, we consider disease outbreaks uh, and public health crises as one of these unframed threats, ones where you don't really have to explain to people why they should be scared of H1N1 or um, COVID was not on the agenda then, but COVID-19, as opposed to uh, other kinds of threats in politics where the causes of harm are more debated and where the harms can be delayed. So these are things where um, it's so we kind of contrast a terrorist attack itself might be an unframed threat that is um, that increases your heart rate that makes you feel anxious, whereas the war on terror, for instance, takes more work for politicians to explain why like a long term threat of terrorism should be something that raises your blood pressure, for instance, and in these frame threats politicians media um, elites are doing a lot more work in both telling you what to be afraid of and also what the solutions to that fear might be, okay? And so, um, again, we look at a variety of coping mechanisms, and one that we focus on in one of the chapters is about trust. And our expectation is that political anxiety, because it, it comes with a lot of uncertainty, should increase trust in people who can help mitigate the threats that have caused you to feel anxious in the first place. Okay, and who are those people? And those are people who have expertise in the particular area that you're concerned about. So in disease outbreaks, we should expect that people who are anxious should turn to people who have medical degrees, who you know, work for the FDA or the CDC um, to provide them information and they should put their trust in those folks to, um, if not totally follow their recommendations, at least listen to them and say that they are trustworthy. Now, in the case of um, unframed threats, this is pretty straightforward. The expertise is the people who have, um, who have the best practices, who have a degree in that area. In, in more contested areas, our expectation is that if a political party has an advantage on that relevant issue, they might be the people that get the boost in trust when people are made anxious about the issue. And what do I mean about this kind of advantage? So we know in politics that the parties are seen as strong on different kinds of issues. So the Republican Party for a long time has had kind of what we call an issue advantage on issues around um, terrorism, um, Sometimes the economy, that one kind of goes back and forth, whereas the Democratic Party is seen as stronger on, even if you don't agree with their positions, they're seen as having a stronger 
um, kind of they're seen as better and stronger on things like healthcare and the environment. Okay, so we expect in these kind of framed areas that the expertise, um, the benefit, and the advantage for anxiety goes to the party that um, has the advantage on that particular policy area. Okay, but let's back up and talk about um, how we actually studied this um, topic, right? So one of the kind of difficulties in using things like survey data um, in tracing out what the effects of anxiety are on, say, policies that people want is we don't really know whether or not people want kind of a more uh, stringent immigration policy for a whole variety of reasons, but they say that, but, and they're anxious about immigration, and we don't really know which one causes which. It may be that people just have policy preferences or they trust different leaders, and then they essentially not make up, but they kind of correlate their their emotion about the issue to that policy. And that is extremely difficult to, um, to tease out in observational survey data. So what, um, Bethany and I did over the course of many years is that we used randomized experiments where we increased anxiety um, randomly among our, the people in our study um, and then uh, compared them to either a control group um, who wasn't made anxious or to a kind of uh, another experimental group where people were made um, to be somewhat less anxious. Um, and so, and then we can trace out like what is the causal effect of creating anxiety on a policy issue on things like trust. So um, one of the things we did was um, we, we had, again, in one of the policy areas that we looked at in the book was disease outbreaks and what happens when people are made anxious about disease outbreaks. And in 2011, uh, we did a, a, a number of studies with disease outbreaks. And so just to be clear, we never gave anyone a disease. We just had them read about these diseases and become anxious. I know oh, someone is always like, did you give people smallpox? And we did not. Um, we had them read different stories about a smallpox outbreak. And we compared among the people who read about, so we had a control story that was not about smallpox. We had a, one story and we randomly assigned people to read one of these stories. So we know that on average, these folks in our survey experiment are the same. So this, just, this is a, a survey from 2011, you, YGP is just, that's the survey firm, YouGov Polymetrics that ran this survey, it had 600 people in it. We randomly assigned them to either read this control story, a story about a, a smallpox outbreak that had happened 30 years before um, they were reading or a present um, outbreak that was happening at the time. And just so we're clear, we this, this was a deceptive study because smallpox is an eradicated disease and no one was having a smallpox outbreak. We did tell them at the end that this was, not, this was fictional. Um, uh, so we debriefed them at the end and we went through all the kind of uh, the ethics boards that we had to go through. Um, but we had these folks read these stories. They looked kind of like uh, New York Times stories. That's what they look like. That's what they were reading. Um, and then we compared um, their attitudes about a variety of things after they read it. And again, we, we can draw some conclusions that we actually are actually causing these differences because the only thing that's different is about what they're reading. So after they read this story about smallpox or, or not, they are asked a whole series of questions about how much they trust different um, agencies and individuals to provide them information about smallpox, okay? And then we also asked a variety of questions about whether um, they would support a variety of um, best of health uh, practices that are kind of deemed by the WHO to be the best practices in a public health outbreak, including things like quarantining people, um, mandating vaccinations. Um, you know, these might sound familiar to you. Um, these were, again, we did this now 10 years ago, um, but these are all kind of best practices in, um, in these kinds of pandemics. So uh, I can 
tell you a little bit about the folks in the study, but the big thing to know is that um, this is a nationally representative sample. We had 600 respondents. Um, on average, they were, um, you know, pretty meet, uh, pretty healthy. We asked them about their health. They were average 51, and there were no differences across our conditions on their demographics. Okay. So we did ask them after we had them read these stories, how anxious, how strongly do you feel a variety of emotions? And we asked them about anxiety. And here, this is just a bar graph to show you that in our control condition, which again was not about smallpox, the, the scale goes from zero to not at, not at all to one, which is up here, um, extremely anxious. So we have the kind of our control folks are not feeling very anxious at all, whereas our people who read about a present smallpox outbreak feel quite anxious. Um, they're kind of the middle uh, of the scale, um, and our people who read about a past smallpox outbreak are somewhere in between. Okay, so then we're, we ask them again, we know that we've made them anxious. We ask them about who they trust. Um, to give them this information about smallpox. And our expectation is that people who are more anxious, those people in our present smallpox condition, are going to be the most trusting of the people who can help them the most, right? Who can mitigate the threat, who can make them feel better, okay? And what we find is, so we ask them about how much you trust these actors. This is from not at all to I trust them a great deal at 100. Oh, this, I'm sorry, this is the percentage of people who say they trust this person a great deal um, or this um, agency. So we ask them about their doctor. Um, do you trust the CDC? Do you trust, this is during um, Obama's presidency. We asked them about some irrelevant actors as well, like Oprah Winfrey and the IRS. And we wanted to see both whether or not anxiety just increases trust in everyone or whether or not it matters who is the actor who we're putting our trust in. Does it make sense who we put our trust in? And here you have, you're seeing the red circles. These are ones that are statistically distinguishable across our two smallpox studies, right? Or two smallpox articles, right? So among people in this, these black circles, those are people who read about a smallpox outbreak in the past. They're pretty trusting of the CDC and um, Health and Human Services and the FDA, but we make them even more trusting when we talk about a, a current disease outbreak and their, when their anxiety is high, right? And so the other thing to show you is, so here again, we, we did increase trust, but not in everyone. We increased trust in these relevant actors, people who have, and agencies that have some expertise in the area of health. Um, and we also asked people, again, we, we asked them whether or not, how much they support policies like requiring people who have smallpox to have a medical exam, requiring them to quarantine. And here what I'm showing you in this graph is what is the support for this policy from um, not very strong at the low end to um, much stronger and they, they support it very strongly at the high end on the right here um, by the level of anxiety that people are displaying after they read the story, right? So these white circles are people who are high on anxiety. We just kind of cut this at the the median, meaning just half of the people are um, on this high end. Um, those folks who are, have high levels of anxiety, again, about smallpox, are significantly more likely to say that they wanna require a vaccine for those people who have smallpox. They wanna put them in isolation. They wanna have them quarantine. As opposed to people who are lower anxiety who are, um, are less likely to hold those policy positions. So again, what we're finding here, and this is consistent, you know, I have, we did 14 different experiments. I always say, you, you can't actually, you, you're just seeing my picture. When I present this work, I always say, I look nice, but I'm, you know, I spent seven years scaring people about politics. So it is a little questionable how nice I am. But um, we do find that this is, this finding that we have in this one study is replicable across multiple different studies, uh, both about smallpox and we did one about, um, H1N1 as well. Um, and so, you know, the, the finding here that we find across 
different policy areas. Um, we, we have studies on immigration. We find pretty similar things. It's an anxiety boost trust in experts, right? Because people and relevant actors, people who believe when you're anxious, you want to put your trust in people who you believe can handle the threat, who have the right information. But the political context can shape who those experts are, particularly with these framed threats, these threats where it's not obvious it's about bodily harm, it's not necessarily going to be the case that we um, recognize the threats as they are. But you might be saying, and, and here it might be worth stopping for some of your questions, you know, okay, well, this was, you know, now quite a long time ago in, in the world of politics. And like, what are we seeing in this pandemic? Because it does not appear that um, we are seeing this kind of anxiety about, about COVID-19 in the same way, or that this has translated into trust in the experts. So I don't know if you want to stop here for questions or sure. if you just want me to press on. <laughs> Either no, way is fine it, with me. Yeah, this is a, this is a great time to, st to pause for a moment. And I do have some questions that are starting to roll into our, our queue. Okay. And again, I'll encourage our audience to drop any specific and formal questions in the Ask the Professor tab. And while folks are thinking, uh, Professor, what I, I'd, I'd actually like to start with a question, and that is, when you consider anxiety, do you also consider the contagion of, of, of anxiety? Meaning, um, you know, I suspect that a lot of these surveys are self-administered and they're sort of individually taken, but you know, do you do you qualify at all that if I'm with a lot of other anxious people, that rubs off on me, and I start to, you know, my, my own anxiety is affected by my my group or the people I'm with. So I think that's a fascinating question that our particular data, as you as you said, cannot get to. Right. So we're we're mm. looking at individual surveys. We can look at within the survey data, and I do think this is one of the things that, um, you know, and I teach about surveys and experiments, and I think they are really important in getting to these processes, but they don't account for the social nature mm -hmm. of emotion and emotional contagion in ways that I think you've pointed out really astutely. And I think one of the ways we can get at this is think about the role of media coverage and how mm -hmm. Um, media coverage and perhaps social networks, not necessarily social media, but social networks themselves may play into who gets anxious. And I'll talk about this a little bit when we get to the pandemic, because of the polarization around anxiety itself around the pandemic and partisanship, I do think that that social nature really does play a role because the people around you, at least for the last 18 months should we're telling you whether or not you should be scared or right. not and impar right. and about what, right? right. Um, and so I do think that social nature matters a, a great deal in ways that our data don't allow us to get some leverage on, but we can kind of sure. theoretically think about how they matter. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, one follow-up question, and again, I've got a few other questions from our audience. Sure. Um, if you list 10 items, 10 items in your survey and ask folks to gauge their anxiety, immigration, gun control, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Um, have you found that a really high anxiety of a single issue like the pandemic just naturally drags the anxiety from all the other issues up as well? Oh my gosh, what a great question. Um, so that's not how we have necessarily done this. So mostly we have told people what to be anxious about. <laughs> but I do think yep. again, like we we're like this is a study on immigration. We're going to make you anxious about immigration. Yep. But I do think this question as to what kinds of anxieties go together is really fascinating. And mm -hmm. again, I'll point to um, the ways that political leaders um, tend to group different kinds of threats together. Mm -hmm. will lead people to pick up, at least people who are paying attention to politics, lead people to then kind of group different kinds of threats and anxieties together in ways that might or might not be natural, right? So mm -hmm. here's an example, right? So one of the things that we have been hearing about the, for people who are concerned about refugees coming to the United States from Afghanistan is that the concern about refugees is that they are a security threat, right? So that's one of the things that you've been hearing and that 
some of these refugees might be coming over the southern border who are are threats to national security of the United States. Immigration and um, refugees are, and foreign policy don't necessarily all have to go together, but there are political leaders who will who kind of, for their own purposes, lump those things together. And so to the extent that we're seeing anxiety on one set of issues, it tends to correlate with those kind of other issues that the parties are telling you kind of go together. Got it. Yes, thank you. Um, I've got a few questions I'd like to bring to you from our audience. Um, sure. The first, first question I'm going to bring is from Adriana, who's joining us from South Carolina. Uh, in her words, I'm reading, she says, you've mentioned that experts can be trusted. However, experts today are the ones who have been accused of misinforming the public. Uh, political anxiety may increase trust depending on the context. Given the time of your study, which is prior to COVID, do you think that polarization is an important intervening variable that can actually shape the way how doctors in the CDC can be trusted? So you have just um, previewed what I'm going to talk about in the next set okay, of slides good. with my next book project. So absolutely, right? So to the extent, so one of the things that Bethany and I could never uh, were not creative enough to think about or was not even on the horizon for us when we were designing these studies is to think about a president and a political party who would um, undercut the experts and tell the people in our study that those folks who have the medical degrees are not trustworthy and you should not listen to them. And that's essentially what we've seen in the last 18 months, right? We started with the Trump White House um, in COVID-19, basically telling people a different set of stories about whether COVID itself was a threat and who you should be listening to um, than the medical experts. And pitting the politics of the pandemic against the medical experts then tells people, you know, that they should use their their partisanship and their political affiliation to decide who to listen to rather than rely on um, the concern that they have and what we actually find in the next and I'll talk about in the next set of slides when whenever we get to it is that what we find in the pandemic is that even emotional reactions to the pandemic are polarized by party that is and I'll show you the data um, Democrats just are more worried and they are uh, more they have all sorts of negative emotions, much more so than their Republican counterparts. And part of that is about um, the parties, and particularly the Trump White House, telling people not to trust or to ch the medical experts, or to at least trust them less than they trust the president. Great, thank you. And and again, uh, Adriana, uh, uh, Shane is going to be going into this a little bit uh, more in depth. Um, one more question and then we're going to move on. This comes from sure. Rashid again. Rashid is joining us from Morocco. Uh, Rashid asks, what kind of expertise and intellectual marginality must we produce to deal with the problematic, the problem of anxious politics and its probable overwhelming blackout in public life? Um, so I, I will kind of uh, not push back against that question, but one of the things we talk about in the book is that anxiety is is both it may imperil democracy, but it may have promise for democracy as well, right? So anxiety is not only good or bad. It is a tool that gets people to pay closer attention to politics. And while, you know, I'm writing this book about polarization, and I think polarization is problematic for politics, so is inattention. And so to the extent that what anxiety does is gets us to pay attention to politics and gets us to pay attention to issues that might be threatening, um, not only to kind of security issues, but also to economic issues or also to um, kind of the livelihood of marginalized people. Anxiety can be good, right? That's what social movements are doing. They're telling people to be worried about a social problem that they might not otherwise have been worried about. And so I think anxiety has this real potential but it also has a downside, right? So getting people to support best practices in public health outbreaks means also that people are supportive of civil liberties restrictions, right? We're, 
being really supportive of a quarantine also means that you're willing to take rights away from others. And maybe that's necessary, and I do think it's necessary in a pandemic, but I think we, we want to think about what are the downsides of that as well. So I think we're, we come down on the side of anxiety is a tool. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it, does, it has this kind of potential to undercut democracy, but it also has this potential to empower people to pay closer attention. Great, thank you. Well, let's go ahead and move on. And again, okay. I'll start to uh, collect some questions and we'll, I'll just uh, drop them in when the time comes right. Sure. Okay, so you, you know, to this point, you might have said, oh, you know, what she's telling us can't possibly be true anymore, right? Because people were anxious that, or we made them anxious about a public health outbreak and they became more trusting of, of medical experts. But that's not what we're seeing in the, in the U.S., at least nationally in the last 18 months. And so this is the subject, um, among other things, of my newest book pro project with Sarah Wallace Goodman and Tom Papinski, which should be out in mid-2022 called Pandemic Politics. Um, and here, what, we're, what we've been doing for, since March of 2020 is looking at the effects of um, polarization and in partisanship on responses of the American public to the pandemic. Um, and so this is just a kind of how the way that we open the book, which is to think about the Rose Garden ceremony that was there to um, replace um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court, and that's Amy Coney Barrett, that's Donald Trump. And this Rose Garden ceremony um, looks like a normal kind of White House event. But it is a kind of example of the depolarization in the Ameri in American politics. Um, you know, Amy Coney Barrett was kind of uh, was confirmed very quickly during an election season in the last months of the Trump presidency. Um, the Rose Garden event was held during the pandemic with very few masks, became a super spreader event. So this is kind of a kind of lens on to understanding what's going on in the pandemic and why it's quite different than um, the politics that we have seen um, in anxious politics. Okay, And what we argue in this book, and we'll get to um, some of the, the data, because I want to get to your questions, is that the par that partisanship, that is the identity that people have and affiliation that they have with a party, is the most consistent predictor of differences in U.S. health behaviors and attitudes. This partisan response was not inevitable. It was due to choices made by political leaders. Um, we put a lot of responsibility on the Trump White House, but not solely. Um, partisanship ma has made this crisis worse, and it continues to have a, a deleterious effect on the uh, kind of the pandemic response. Um, the effects of COVID-19 were all encompassing and other countries have fared better, um, not just with their death tolls, but also with their vaccination rates, with getting um, mitigation measures in place more nationally. Um, you know, the, the pandemic was always going to be, you know, if we look at some of the kind of pre-existing conditions in the United States, it was always going to be difficult but it was made more difficult by the deep political polarization um, that existed prior to um, the Trump presidency, but was made um, increasingly obvious um, in the last year of the Trump presidency. We have a very difficult and overwhelmed healthcare system. We have economic and racial inequality. And the Trump response um, in the White House was to be very, very focused, even in the very early days of the pandemic, on the economy and getting the economy back up and running very quickly um, without um, a kind of functional and uh, health bureaucracy. Um, and we were also, I started last, um, I started in uh, January 2020, uh, teaching an intro to American politics, talking about an impeachment, um, and we ended talking about a pandemic. If you just remember how um, intense those several months were, um, we're also talking about a time where we have this kind of polarization that is, again, encompassing all of, of politics at this moment, and then kind of in walks coronavirus. Um, so we already have these pre-existing conditions that are um, making the perhaps the response was going to always be 
perhaps slow, perhaps a little bit sloppy, but the um, particular factors that created the um, response and exacerbated the polarization also made the response um, in the public quite partisan, right? So in the very early days, we have the President of the United States downplaying the seriousness of the disease and that message also being played mostly on conservative media and by Republican members of Congress. Um, the thing that really prompts an executive response is not cases of coronavirus coming from China, it's not the first case in the United States, it's when the stock market um, plummets where we get this executive response. Part of this is that um, in a kind of election year, um, it, the president is very focused on um, keeping the economy up and running because that is one of the ways that presidents get reelected. And this particular president cared much less about um, a kind of an expansive reelection, but focused much more on kind of turning out the base. Um, and the, the base was not the people who were being affected early on in the pandemic. The pandemic starts on the coast, it starts in states that have democratic governors. Um, and there is this kind of um, conflict between what uh, the Trump White House wants to do about this pandemic, which is leave it to the states, with the ne necessity to have a national response, okay? And in this environment, you know, there is a lot of anxiety in the public, but they don't necessarily know this is a new threat, they don't know where to turn, and the, um, the response from uh, the political leadership is quite different, right? So really from the kind of Republican Party, uh, National Republican Party, the states are different. Um, the National Republican Party, the messaging very early on is that this is not a big threat, um, downplaying the seriousness of it, the Democrats are kind of much more concerned about the health threats, um, Republicans concerned about the economic threats, right? These are kind of big statements, but we can, you know, I can give you the citations for the papers on all of this. Um, and the, meanwhile, the kind of medical experts who are saying to shut everything down are getting, um, again, undercut by particularly the White House here. And so we might expect that when people in the public come into this very noisy environment, very conflicting about who they should trust, they could use, it could be that when people themselves feel that they are at risk, when they are feeling anxious, that they will then be more likely to, again, seek these protective policies, these pro-health practices. They will follow the guidance of the, about social distancing that the CDC is playing out. I will also say that the messaging from the CDC early on is very, um, it's very noisy, it, you know, do we wear masks? Do we not wear masks? Who should wear masks? Are they effective? This kind of um, very quick updating and back and forth from the CDC also creates a lot of confusion. So then people don't know who to turn to. And then, so, you know, our, our theories of of politics would suggest maybe, and some of my previous work that we just talked about would suggest that if people are feeling worried and anxious, then they should seek out these these um, policies that are and these practices that should keep them safe. But there is this other part of um, of politics, which is uh, relying on what the people in your party, particular, you know, we call these elite cues, relying on what the the people in your party are telling you, one, whether you should be afraid at all, and then if you are afraid, what are the solutions to that? And to the extent in our kind of public opinion literature, when we find that when all of the people, all the elites in the country basically say we should do one thing, the, the public follows along on average, right? That's not everybody, but it tends to be the case when elites are united, um, then we see the public follow along. But when elites are divided, when they, you know, when someone, when a leader of the Republican Party says you shouldn't be scared of the pandemic and of this disease and Democratic leaders are saying you should be scared, then we might expect that partisanship could be a factor in, um, in influencing people's attitudes, okay? And so what we, um, what we did was early, very early on in like late February of 2020, um, 
my, co my co-authors and I uh, applied to the National Science Foundation for what we call a rapid grant, which was to get money very quickly um, to get into the field and survey Americans about how they were responding to this kind of very new novel coronavirus. And we went into the field in March of 2020, March 20th, um, and we surveyed 3,000 people. We did this through YouGov. And we asked about health behaviors, about their attitudes, about their emotions. Um, we have all sorts of things. And we have now followed these same 3,000 respondents six times. And so we have been following them since March of 2020. Our last survey wave was in um, April 21. Um, and we have a very robust time series of the same respondents to see how their attitudes, their behaviors have changed over time. Um, one of the papers from this um, project are already out. The book should be coming out soon. Um, I have a recent grant that will um, allow us to follow the same folks again into the future to see what are the long-term impacts of the pandemic. But just, uh, you know, I'm just showing you here, um, on average, we ask people whether or not um, they are doing these behaviors, this is in March of 2020, um, to um, in response to the pandemic. So we asked them about things like, did you go to the doctor? Or have you washed your hands more? And these are just on average, what are the responses? And so it's zero yes, one, I'm sorry, zero no, one yes. It's just a dichotomous. And so this is just showing you that, you know, on average, lots of people are washing their hands more, lots of people, and this is in March of 2020, are avoiding gatherings. Um, and but what we find is that on average these things are true but there is this really big variation by um, partisanship i know this is really small i'm just and you know, i don't expect you to get all of the detail but there's i'm just going to give you a quick overview so the, the these graphs are of those same um behaviors i just told you about we've asked those six different times on six different surveys um, we did not ask about masks um, early on in the first survey. We asked about them in the second. Um, and what we're showing here is just the proportion of people who said they are doing these different behaviors, their self-identified partisanship, okay? And so Republicans are always down here. They're this circle. Democrats are here. They're this square. They're up here. And others, these are people who are independents who don't lean toward any party and they're always in the middle. So the big, you know, the big takeaway from all of these behaviors is that these gaps that we see, so one thing to note is on average, most people, regardless of their partisanship, are following the best practices that the CDC suggests in a pandemic, okay? However, the other thing to note is that there are these gaps between what Republicans say they're doing and what Democrats say they're doing and that we see in March of 2020 that just never go away over time. They are reinforced, the partisanship is reinforced over time. These gaps that we see don't get smaller, right? Occasionally on like one survey, you'll see that they get smaller, but they are on average locked in as of March 20. And this is not the same, this is the same question that we ask over time, but we ask it new every time. So these are real differences among the same respondents, okay? Um, we also ask a series of questions about how worried you are and how worried you are about a variety of things. Again, here on the, the x-axis here is just the time that we've asked this question. So this is March of 20 to March of 20 and April 21. Um, this again, like we've asked um, the same question, how worried are you about your friends getting sick, about you getting sick? And for some of these, there aren't big differences, although Democrats always ex say that they are more worried than, Dem than Republicans. Um, we can control for a lot. So these are, what I'm showing you here are just averages. We can use more sophisticated statistical models where we, we control for demographics, your education, your age, where you live. We know about the policies of mitigation of COVID in your area. We know the kind of partisanship of your governor. We can throw all of those COVID cases in your area. We can throw all of those in a statistical model and these findings still hold. 
So Democrats are expressing more concern. They are more worried about all of these things, but the biggest differences are whether or not they are going to get sick, whether their friends are going to get sick, um, then Republicans and then independents. And again, those differences that we see early on in the pandemic have just repeated themselves over time. Um, I'm just gonna make sure that we get through some of this. Um, so the other thing to note is that we also asked just more general emotions questions. And here's here's actually a really interesting set of findings. One is that um, Democrats, again, the big story here, Democrats are have all of the negative emotions, more so than Republicans. This is just the proportion on the y-axis of people who say they feel this emotion in all of our surveys and on the x-axis is just time here. So this is anger and disgust and hope is the one that I think is the most interesting. So over time, Republicans uh, say that they're more hopeful. And this one where you see this convergence in terms of across the parties, again, Republican Democrats are here, um, except for hope where these are Republicans who are higher on hope, they're more hopeful. This convergence on negative emotions is in our March 21 sample, um, our March 21 wave, which, which is after the inauguration of Joe Biden. So part of this is what people are saying is, I am angry, I am disgusted, I am anxious. And some of that has to do with your political leadership being in charge. Because what happens in March of 21 in this survey wave is that Democrats all of a sudden are hopeful and Republicans are less hopeful than they have been over time. So again, this is to say that, and this is partially why in our previous book, we, we are using experiments because what seems to be happening here is that people already know um, what policies they want they seem to know they seem to have a sense of um, how they want how their behaviors and then they adjust their emotion levels to match that rather than having the emotion be the kind of push for the policy areas um, and so we'll just i'll just briefly go through this kind of Study, case study that we do a face mask so you can see how this works in a specific area. And then um, and then I will conclude. So, you know, face masks are one of these issues like I, I talked about earlier where the CDC message kind of changes really rapidly over time. And where we have um, a federal system where there's variation in policy state to state and even within states about whether or not you have to wear a mask, where you have to wear a mask, whether or not private businesses have to set the rules or the state or counties do. And face masks in the United States are a major cultural shift, right? This is not something that most people did prior to the pandemic, um, a country that relies very heavily on individualism and freedom. Um, might have a more difficult time with this cultural shift um, to this kind of more, and particularly people who value individualism and freedom above, say, communitarianism or, and these are all values that M Americans on average hold, both of these sets of values, but, um, you know, your ideology, your ideology does correlate with which ones of these you find to be more important. Very early on, we know that the president was under, again, undercutting the messaging about public health, about the mass early on in April of 2020, when the CD starts to recommend mass, he says um, that he's not going to wear one. Um, he just doesn't see it as an important thing to message on. Um, when he himself gets COVID-19 and is hospitalized, and we know more about that hospitalization, do some, some really interesting work from the New York Times, um, he tells people not to be afraid of COVID, even after he himself looks very ill. Um, he tells people, don't be afraid, don't let it dominate your life. And while other Republican leaders like um, Dick Cheney and uh, congressional Republicans and Senate Republicans are starting to tell people in the spring you should actually wear masks. We do see this very um, this person who has the bully pulpit essentially coming right. He comes back from Walter Reed Hospital. He has a mask and he takes it off right. And this is very much um, the kind of 
messaging that you see um, from the uh, from the White House, and and this is also matched by. I'll just show this again. This is this is in April, where you see this this there's variation across the country in state policy about whether or not you must wear a mask when you're indoors. Okay, and so we can see again over time these are just error bars that tells you the uncertainty around our respondents um, attitudes these are full models that again use use all the demographics um, and we we don't start like i said we didn't start asking about masking until our second wave of our data in april of 2020 these up here these people at the top this is a question about whether or not you have worn a mask just like we ask about hand washing and other kinds of behaviors, we ask people whether they've worn a mask. Um, the people who identify as Democrats are always more likely to say, no matter what survey we ask them on, that they have worn a mask than their independent or Republican colleagues. And the fact that these bars don't overlap tells you that that is a statistically distinguishable effect that also accounts for how many COVID cases you have in your area. Again, all of the demographics that we might think are leading people to wear a mask. So these partisan differences stand up even to all of those other alternative specifications. We also see these are not our data, these are, and you probably have seen this in a variety of other places, that this partisan split that we see um, on the individual level, you also see uh, on masking and other health behaviors, you also see for vaccination. So if you're just looking at this graph, this is on the x-axis, the percentage of the county that voted for Trump and Pence in 2020 and their vaccination rate. And you can see how that vaccination rate um, goes down the more um, the more likely the county was to um, have a kind of to vote for Trump and Pence. Now, this can't tell us about individuals within these counties, but I do think this goes back to the point that Andy made earlier about emotional contagion, but also the ways that social networks and the places that we live and the people who we communicate with can facilitate the the identity and the political identity being important in the way that we make decisions about something as fundamental as health. Okay, so again, we can think about anxiety and democracy might be that anxiety might help democracy, right? So George Marcus, who wrote a very influential book in political science about anxiety, argues that the ability of the press and others to present us with bad news is meant to disquiet us, but it serves us well. Um, that is perhaps the case. I have, I've often think that we could use some more worry about the pandemic um, that, and maybe that was the key to getting people to um, uh, social distance earlier on. But it is also the case that um, fears can limit democracy in a variety of ways. So um, this kind of, again, we want to think about this protection um, Anxiety is, is consequential for contemporary politics, but this protection is determined by our political context and the people who tell us about what to be anxious about um, do have an influence on whether, one, we, we feel anxious about particular poli policies uh, and policy areas and what kind of solutions we want for them. Okay, and I'm gonna stop there and look forward to the rest of your questions. Thank you so much for sharing all that data and tying it together. Now you essentially you answered uh, my question, my first question, which is what what about the scientist part of your political scientist? Thank you, thank you for sharing that data. <laughs> we've got a we've got a lot of questions that have come in. I'm going to encourage our audience to uh, drop new questions or, or questions that come to you uh, as we speak now into the Ask the Professor tab. Um, I'd like to start actually with. Um, with a question from Kate. Kate is joining us uh, from Boston. Um, she asks, do you think that extreme partisanship perhaps functions as a sort of barrier or anxiety prevention overlay that serves to fend off or deflect appropriate anxiety? And I'm, I'm gonna sort of underline a couple of things in that question she submitted. Um, and that is the difference between uh, appropriate anxiety and dangerous anxiety. Um, and the way that extreme part partisanship affects that. 
So this is a great question. So um, I talked about George Marcus and his his book and his co-author's book about anxiety. And one of the, the arguments that they make in this book is that one of the functions of anxiety is that it should lessen the effects of partisanship on vote choice and other kinds of political behaviors. They find that when people express more anxiety, um, they are um, particularly about political candidates, they might they rely less on that what we call a standing decision, that partisan identity in the vote choice that they make. And so that is also what we found in the book uh, in Anxious Politics, right? That people who are made anxious, so Democrats who are made anxious about immigration, for instance, are more trusting of Republican elites and are more likely to support Republican kinds of pol conservative policies on immigration. And, but it is a question about um, in this kind of deeply partisan uh, context that we're living in when partisanship was, is now not just, so Lily Mason at now at Johns Hopkins has um, a book about partisanship as a social identity. And her argument is one that we rely on fairly heavily, which is that partisanship is no longer, and it never was all, always about who you voted for. It is an identity that people have, but what is different in the last 20 years or so is that that partisan identity also lines up with a, a number of other social identities that people hold dear to them in the ways that the parties have um, have been filtered and the, the groups who now go with the parties are no longer very cross-cutting, right? So um, your partisan identity now also lines up with your religion more, li is more likely to line up with your religion and line up with your race and line up with um, other deeply held identities in ways that they didn't always. And so what happens when partisanship becomes salient is that that identity, all those other identities become salient as well. And it becomes more difficult to shift um, what you're doing and, you're, and how you're thinking about politics because it is, it is now, you know, you have to shift your whole mindset. And so I am going to get <laughs> to answer the question, but I think it's important to know, to note that because what happens is if I, if being a Republican means that I need to be, I mean to be dismissive of the seriousness of the pandemic um, in order to be consistent with my party and the people who I identify with, then it makes it harder to then say I'm anxious about it. And in the same way, Democrats who might not be con that concerned may have to may have to shift this kind of sense of oh this is really scary i should actually be more concerned to then fit with that partisanship and um so i think it, it partisanship has become a barrier but it didn't need to and it became a bar barrier because the messaging around it was so divided by party early on so it was a very mm -hmm. long answer to the question <laughs> No, that was great. Thank you. Um, this question comes from Adriana. It's a it's a little bit of a longer question, um, but we're going to shift now, I think, through this question away from the domestic examples you've given. Mm -hmm. Adriana writes that the results you're mentioning tonight are based on the U.S. case, but many people like herself have been living in developing countries experiencing different outbreaks, not major like COVID. Based on these small outbreaks, fear has led to anxiety disorders and people uh, see how basic functions like memory can be affected. In your experience, uh, uh, Professor, is it memory, particularly flashbulb memory, a factor for understanding the relationship between anxiety and trust? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I'm going to back up a little bit to talk a little bit about the, we do not in the, in our data look at memory, but we do know from the literature on anxiety and anxiety disorders, that um, anxiety does influence um, the type of information. So we do know from our book that what happens when people are anxious is they seek out, they pay attention to, and they remember more threatening information. So we have a, a whole part of the book where we look at information seeking. So this is gonna get to this question about memory. Um, and so 
what we find is when we make people anxious, they are, when we put them in an information environment, they pay attention to the kind of the most threatening news. I always use the example of if you've ever had, say, a skin lesion and gone on WebMD or some other or Google and then read about all of the terrible things that could it could be and convince yourself you have skin cancer, you have experienced this effect of anxiety on information seeking. So we know from that work in anxious politics that um, anxiety can influence memory. Um, what we haven't looked at and, and it is also the case that we know that anxiety does influence the tagging of, of events and information. And this is, you know, PTSD research also finds that. Um, what we don't look at, and I think is interesting, is thinking about the effects of that information seeking on trust. Um, we do ask in some of the studies whether or not people would trust those experts with to provide them information, but we lo don't look directly at the effects of memory itself on trust. But that's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, you've done a great job of of describing with data and the and the sort of the way that you've contextualized this. Uh, what could be seen as the problem, I think, or at least the the intersection between anxiety and democracy. Jonathan, though, is going to ask you to skip all that and give us the punchline. So, uh, yeah, if, if our perceptions are so driven by fear to the point of investing in this false narrative, how in the world do we become brave enough to dig into the scary truth? How, what, what's the solution here? Well, I don't know what the scary truth is. I mean, dem isn't democracy <laughs> about, uh, I mean, I'm going to give the political science answer, right? Which democracy yeah. is about the discussion over what are the policies that we should care about what are the actual issues that we need to deal with and how can we um, work together to solve those problems now maybe fear doesn't necessarily help that but again it helps people to pay attention to different mm -hmm. issues um, it, what i do think is uh, one thing we haven't talked about is that there are certain issues that are easier to scare people about because they are they're either about out groups and that makes people worried or they are about again physical threats but there are a lot of there are a lot of problems in politics that don't have easy visuals they don't have physical threats and they are ones that we as a society need to pay attention to and the issue always comes up that is climate change right that climate change but but now we're seeing the effects of climate change and perhaps that will get people at least paying attention enough to know, um, to, to demand some change, right? I'm not of the mind actually that fear leads to false narratives. I do think we should worry about uh, elites manipulating people with fear, but that's really hard to figure out when, when elites actually are manipulating people and when they're actually just trying to get them to pay attention to issues that are important in democracy and what issues are important in democracy should be led by those people in the citizenry and what they uh, what they think is important great thank you uh, last question tonight uh, goes to Andy in Chapel Hill that's me um, <laughs> you know my, my daughter is 21 uh, she was born in uh, literally the day before Y2K. You remember the big Y2K? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so she and all the students that all of these teachers, participants tonight teach, and probably many that you teach at Syracuse, have all grown up in a very anxious world, starting with 9-11, and then the recession in 2007 and 8, and then um, the, the political sort of turmoil, and then, of course, uh, the pandemic. So they've only known generationally anxiety. Do you have any sense, and this is, I think, just more for you as a, as a, as a scholar rather than the research you've done, but do you have any sense on this notion of generational anxiety? I mean, if you're, is, is there this sense that, that you're, you're born into, and that's just your worldview because of these big events that have influenced the kids that we're all teaching on a regular basis? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, Jennings and Nimi have this very interesting book called Generations in Politics, where they follow um, the class of 1968 over time. And they have interviewed, and now uh, they interviewed um, 
high school seniors who were graduating in 1968, which, as many of you know, was a very anxious time in politics, right? We have assassinations, you have massive social change, um, the war in Vietnam. And Jennings and Amy followed these folks over their life course and now have, have interviewed their children and some of their grandchildren. And um, that would be a great place for people to look to think about what are the influences of large social changes on people's attitudes. And I, I do think that what I try and kind of tell my own students is um, this is this is a very anxious time. And I can't tell them that it's going to get back to something like the 90s, right, when I grew up, where which is in some ways a very unusual time. Um, I don't know what a normal time is anymore, but we know that other generations have grown up in times of large social upheaval. And that's what we're experiencing right now, and that causes anxiety. And I think what I try to get them to think about is what are the tools that they have what are the skills that they can bring to help change things in ways that can make things seem less scary, right? So it, in, even if they bring nothing else out of my class, I want them to understand that they have choice, they have agency, and they have some skills that they can use to kind of work collectively to change our politics so that perhaps, even if there are world events that seem nerving that they can feel prepared and efficacious to change those as a part of the citizenry. I think that's a lovely and very optimistic uh, answer and I, I agree and, and if you consider a point that you've made subtly and sometimes not so subtly that anxiety is not always a negative thing but it does it does provide opportunities for people to respond to what's happening and so whether it's the you know greatest generation to uh, responding to the depression in World War II, or whether it's uh, what I see actually in my my daughter's age group, and I suspect a lot of teachers in the room tonight, kids are super dialed in right now. They are very aware of what's going on, um, and and maybe that's the that's the un the unintended but very positive uh, consequence. Sure. Yeah. Uh, At least I hope so. <laughs> I hope so as well. Shana, thank you so much for joining us tonight and for sure. sharing your work. Uh, please do keep in touch. Okay. Sounds good. And I want to thank all of our audience tonight for joining uh, tonight's session. Uh, please um, sign up for our email uh, listserv or follow our social media to see upcoming events at the National Humanities Center and our education programs. Uh, that does include our next webinar um, on, what's that say, September the 9th, next week. I'll be joined by Ruth Ben Giat from uh, New York University. The title of the episode is Strongmen and Dictators. And I hope you can join us. Uh, this will be after the longer holiday weekend. I hope you have a, a great day at school tomorrow, whether it's in person or in some kind of hybrid model. Uh, use the weekend to recharge just a little bit. I'll, we'll see you next week, I hope. Thank you, everybody, for joining tonight's uh, webinar. We'll see you again next time. Thank you.